before we construct a confidence interval, there are some conditions that we need to verify. So we need to make sure these conditions are met. Otherwise, we can take all of the steps of completing this method, but our results aren't going to carry weight. The results are only reliable, assuming we meet these conditions. So in order to estimate a population proportion, our sample that we collected our data from must be random and independent. Our samples must be large enough to expect at least 10 successes and 10 failures. And if our sample is collected without replacement, meaning as soon as an item selected from the population or a person is selected, they're not put back in, so they can't be selected a second time, then our population must be 10 times larger than our sample. So as far as conditions 1 and 3 are concerned, we're going to assume that those are met since it's difficult to know or to be able to really verify that unless we know how the experiment was conducted sometimes. So for our purposes, we'll assume that those are met and we're dealing with reliable data in that sense. But that leaves us with the second condition to verify. So what we need to know is that our number of successes is something greater than or equal to 10 and our number of failures is also greater than or equal to 10. So in some cases that's easy to identify because we're told a thousand people were surveyed, 15 people responded this way, everybody else responded this way. So we just have those numbers to deal with. Other times information is reported as a proportion or a percentage. So we'll be told that 15% responded one way, the other percent responded some other way. So in those cases where we're not given that actual specific number of successes, then we'll need to verify that our sample size n times our sample proportion is greater than or equal to 10. And if we take our sample size times our sample proportion, that gets us our number of successes that we'll need. To get our number of failures, we'll take n times 1 minus our sample proportion and verify that that's greater than or equal to 10. So, in order to verify the conditions for the process that we're talking about in this section, we'll need to verify that both of these statements are correct. So in example two, we want to refer back to the previous example. We want to verify that the conditions are met to construct a confidence interval estimate for the proportion of Americans who approve of the way Barack Obama is handling his job as president. So in this case, our sample size was n equals 1,000. And our sample proportion, the proportion of people who believed he is doing a good job, was 0.43 or 43 percent. So to get our number of successes, we need to take our sample size times p hat, in this case 1,000 times 0 0.43, to get 430. That's greater than or equal to 10, so we can check that condition. We know that we have a large enough number of successes. We also need to consider n times 1 minus p hat. So this is our sample size times the proportion of people who didn't approve. So we would take 1,000 times 1 minus 0 0.43 and get 570, which is also greater than or equal to 10. So our two conditions are met. We had a large enough sample to get at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. Now we want to construct a 90% confidence interval for the proportion of Americans who approve of the way Barack Obama is handling his job as president. Since we know the conditions are met, this process will be valid. So if we pull up StatCrunch, and under the Stat menu, go to Proportion Stats. In this case, we're dealing with one sample data, and we want to select with Summary. So the information we need to input are a number of successes, number of observations, and then for now, skip this hypothesis test information, and we're going to set a confidence level. So for our first example, we want that to be 0.9, or 90%. We had 430 successes, so 430 people who said they approve of his job as president, out of 1,000 total observations. So we enter those two values, set our confidence level, and click Compute. 
So this is going to give us the count and the total that we input. It's going to give us that sample proportion, which matches up with what we had before. And then our lower limit and upper limit. So these are the upper and lower bounds of our confidence interval that we want to report. So we could report this as 0 0.4042, if we round these to about four decimal places, and 0 0.4558. So that's our 90% confidence interval estimate. Now we want to look at doing the same thing, but with a 95% interval and or 95% confidence level and 99% confidence level. So we can go back to the options menu, keep that same information that we already input. Now change this to 0.95, and again generate our results. We see that we get some slightly different results here for our lo uh, lower and upper limit. So now we could report this interval as 0 0.3993 to 0 0.4607. So with a slightly different confidence interval, we're getting slightly different upper and lower bounds. And do this one more time for 99%. And again, report out this lower and upper limit. So these were the results of using a 90% confidence level, a 95% confidence level, and a 99% confidence level. So we want to talk a little bit about what changed with each of those different results. So in this case, with the examples we looked at, in each case we increased our level of confidence and the width of each of those intervals changed. So if we set up a number line here, starting at 0 0.38, 0 0.39, 0 up to 0 0.45, actually we need to go just a little bit higher here, 0 0.46 and 0 0.47. So with each of these intervals we constructed, we ended up with a different range of values. With the first interval, it was between about 0.4 and a little over 0.45. So that was our 90% confidence interval. When we increased our confidence to 95%, that interval started now a little bit above 3.9 or 0 0.39 and stretched all the way up to a little over 0.46. And with the last interval, when we used 99% confidence, this stretched all the way down to about a little above 0.38 and all the way up to a little over 0.47. So each time we increase the confidence level, or the higher we set that confidence level to be, the wider our confidence interval became. So that confidence interval takes on a wider range of values as the confidence level increases. So in order to be more confident, we have to be less precise. So this red bar represented again our 99% confidence level. So this result had the highest confidence but the least precision because there's the widest possible range of values that our true population proportion could be. It could be as low as 0.39 or as high as 0.46 or anywhere in between. And our lowest confidence that we looked at, 90%, had a tighter range of values. So it's still a span but a smaller span. So if we want to be more precise, like we did with this blue interval, having that smaller range of values, then we have to be less confident. So there's always a balance between confidence and precision when we're constructing these intervals. 
as one increases, the other has to decrease.